अस्मत गुरु बियर महा अस्मत परम गुरु बियर महा अस्मत सर्व गुरु बियर महा सो टुडे वी आर कंटिन्यूइंग ऑन विथ द ग्रेटनेस ऑफ शरणागति एंड वीव डन द प्रिलिमिनरी फर्स्ट सेशन सो वी आर नाउ गोइंग टू लुक एट द इंट्रोडक्शन इंट्रोडक्शन द ओरिजिन ऑफ श्री वैष्णवइज्म इज वेल पोर्ट्रेड इन श्री विष्णु पुराणा इट इज बेस्ड ऑन वैदिक थॉट्स Alwars were the early early crusaders of Sri Vaishnava Sri Vaishnavism the main truths and principles of this school of thought laid foundation by its exponents like Sri Man Natamunigal Yamunacharya Ramanuja and so on the prime exponent of Sri Vaishnavism is Sri Ramanuja his nine works are Vedarta Sangraha Sri Bhashya Gitarta Sangraha Vedanta Deepa Vedanta Sara Sharanagati Gajya Sri Ranga Gajya Vaikuntha Gajya and Nitya Gajya All these works reiterate the Vedic thoughts to the society on the supremacy of the, of Lord Sri Man Narayana Sri Ramanuja established 74 Sima Saradipadis to preach and propagate the principles of Sri Vaishnava philosophy in the length and breadth of India It is necessary to think of 74 Simhasana Adipatis who have contributed for the development of Sri Vaishnavism during their period and gave almost uh, utmost it must be utmost importance to the doctrine of Sharanagati. The 74 Simhasana Adipatis are given as under number 1 Sotai Nambi Enachan Pilayappan number 2 Pundari Kaksha number 3 Keralwan number 4 Sundara Toludhayar number 5 Ramanujan and Pillai Tirumalai Nambi number 6 Bhatta meaning Parashur Bhatta and Sri Rama Pillai meaning his brother Vedavyas Bhatta Kandadi Kandadai Annan number 7 number 8 Nadu Vila Vilalwan Nadu Vilalwan Number nine, Go Matam, Go Mat Madam Mata Ta Alwan. Number ten, Ntiruko Vil Vilu Alwan. Number eleven, Tirumo Gura Alwan. Number twelve, Pilla 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 Alwan. Number thirteen, Nadador Alwan. Number number fourteen, Engal Alwan. Number six fifteen. Anandal one, number number sixteen, uh, Milgal one, number seventeen, Neyuda al one, number eighteen, Setalur uh, Siriya al one, number nineteen, Vedanti al one, number twenty, uh, Koil al one, number twenty one, Ukal al one, Ukal al one, number twenty two. Uh, Aran Aranapura Ta Alwan, number number twenty three, Embar, also known as Govinda, who was Ramanuja's cousin. Twenty four, Kidambi Achan, number five, twenty uh, five, uh, Kaniy Kanyanur Chiri Achan, number six, Echampadi Achan, number seven, Pongil Achan, number twenty eight. Uh, a Champadi Jir, number twenty-nine. Tir Malai Nalan, number thirty. Uh, Chetampali Jir, number thirty-one. Tiru Velara Jir, number thirty-two. Atkondavili Jir, number thirty-three. Tiru Nagari Pilan, number thirty-four. Uh, Karanchi Somaya Jir, number thirty-five. Alankar Venkatachar, number thirty-six. Nambi Karun Deva, number thirty-seven. Shiru Pali Deva Raja Bhatta, number thirty-eight. Pilai Yurandai Yudhayar, number thirty-nine. Tiru Kurangai Piran Pilan, number forty. 
Peria Coel Valala, number 34. Tirukanna Purataraya, number 34. Ashuri Peramal, number 43. Uh, Muni Peramal, number 44. Amangi Peramal, number 35. Maruti Periandan, number 46. Uh, Marun Drila Maruti Shiriya Andan, Andan, number 47. Andan, number 48. Jir Andan, Jir Andan, number 49. Ish, Ishwara Andan, number 50. Ayuni e, Pillai Andan, number 51. Periya Andan, number 52. Shiriya Andan, number... 53, Kurinchiur Siriandan, number 54, Amangiandan, number 55, Alavanda Andan, number 56, Arulala Peramo Imbiramanna, number 57, Tondanur Nambi, number 58, uh, Marundur Nambi, number 59, Malavur Nambi, number 60, Tiru Kurankuri Nambi, number 61. Kuravai Nambi, number 62. Murumbai Nambi, number 63. Varuka Nambi, number 64. Vangipuratu Nambi, number 65. Sri Parankusha Nambi, number 66. Amangi Ammau, number 67. Paruti Kolai Ammau, number 68. Akala Mau Amau, number 69, Sotai Amau, number 70, Murumbai Amau, number 71, Komandur Pillai, number 72, Komandur Ilai Amau, number 73, Kirambi Peramau, number 74, Arkatu Pilla. The concept of Sri Vaishnavism can be traced by knowing the Tattva. Kita and Purushartha. The tattva means the truth or the principle, the principles. Kita means the means, and Purushartha means the goal. And this uh, Purushartha is, of course, usually we understand uh, Dharma, Atakama, Moksha has four Purushartas, Moksha being the Purushartha here for liberation. So the, the truth, Gaudiya Vaishnavas sometimes refer to these as some. Uh, uh, Sambanda, Abhideya, and Prayojana, right? Same thing, Tattvahita and Purusharta, right? These are the, the essence of the Vedas. The earliest Acharya, Yamunacharya, in his Siddhi Triya, which is three books, Ishvara Siddhi, Sambit Siddhi, and uh, I forget the third one, but anyway, exuberantly uh, elaborated the nature of the soul, the nature of matter, and the nature of Ishvara. Ishvara is the name that we give to God. When we talk about in Vedantic terms, we usually use the term Ishvara. Ishvara is, not, is none other than Sriman Narayan. Following him, Ramanuja elicited, elicited more poignantly the essence of Sri Vaishnavism through his writings. Sri Vaishnavism is a significant system of Indian philosophical tradition. Acharyas like Sri Ramanuja, Pillai Lokacharya, and Vedanta Deshika were the chief propounders of this system. Their Vedantic expositions were, were effective, the effective base for Sri Vaishnavism. So Sri Vaishnavism is a theology, but it is also a philosophy. So it is a theology based on the philosophy of Vishishtadvaita Vedanta. Sri Vaishnavism is highly efficacious and independent system this system is an unfolding of the, of the explanations and message of the Prasthana triads. Okay, so Prasthanas are basic philosophical texts of Vedanta, and there are three of them, so that's why it's called Prasthana Triya or Prasthana Triyi, right? These are the Upanishads, which are the Vedanta, the actual last parts of the Shruti or the, or the Vedas, the Brahma Sutras, which are, which are sutra-like aphorisms, very short aphorisms, which have been created by Bhadarayana, sage Bhadarayana, who is uh, identified with, uh, as Veda Vyasa. And the Bhagavad Gita, which is coming in the Itihasa called Mahabharata, which is one of the epic epics, the other one being the Ramayana. 
So Bhagavad Gita is there in the in the uh, in the Mahabharata. So these three these three set bodies of scriptures are called the Prasthana Triya, or the three basic texts of philosophy. In his exposition of Vedanta, uh, deals with the wholeness of the of the vision. While Pillai Lokacharya developed the system of an easily in an easily understandable way through his works like Astadasa Rahasya. So Astadasa means 18. Rahasya means esoteric books on the secret mantras the, or the secrets of Sri Vaishnavism, which we're going to talk about a little bit in, in detail later on. The three secrets are the three mantras which are received at the time of in, in Mantra Upadesha at the time of Panchasamskara or the initiation of into formal initiation into Sri Vaishnavism. So later Vedanta Desika, Vedanta Desika reiterated the necessity of the and significance of sharanagati or surrender in his works like Rahasya Trayasara, which is the magnum opus of uh, Vedanta Deshika, and other other uh, Rahasya Granthas, other books of esoteric secrets on these on these different uh, secret mantras, which are which are also described as the Chilarai Rahasyangal of, of Vedanta Deshika, the smaller Rahasyas. But his major magnum opus, his greatest work, is Rahasya Trayasara. So Pillalagacharya wrote 18 books on esoteric meanings. And Vedanta Deshika, who was a, a, a younger contemporary of Pillalagacharya, uh, he also wrote Rahasya Trayasaram, and also, which is his magnum opus, and his big book, and, uh, and, and, a, and a bunch of smaller books. Uh, on this channel, you can look at some of the uh, expositions by Arthur Narayana and by Dr. M. A. L. Uh, Dr. M. A. L. War is uh, is teaching a class on Mumukshapadi, which is the first book of, of uh, is one of the one of the Astadasa Rahasyas of Pillai Lokacharya, the 18 Rahasyas of Pillai Lokacharya. It has a commentary by Manavalabha Murigal, who was a junior contemporary or grand, let's say grand disciple of Pillai Lokacharya. And uh, then Vedanta Deshika, he is also represented in those classes by Arthur Narayana, who is going through uh, Abhaya Pradhana Saram, which is on Ramacharma Sloka, and also some of the smaller uh, works of, the, of Vedanta Deshika. And we hope that uh, we, we can ask uh, uh, Dr. Chiran Ryan to also ultimately go through the magnum opus Rahasya Triya Saram with us also of Vedanta Deshika. So according to Ramanuja, Brahman, which is a, which is a, a term which we use for, the, Brahman means literally the great, or the, the greatest person, the greatest, the greatest entity, which is also called Ishwara in Vedanta, meaning Sri Mandarayana. Brahman is omniscient, which means all-knowing, eternal uh, uh, and supreme, and uh, appropriating the finite selves as its modes, as its modes. So uh, the idea of, of Ramanuja, or the idea of actually great sages before Ramanuja, because Ramanuja quotes in his books, he quotes uh, uh, Bodhayana, Dramida, Tanka, Dravida. There, there are these different sages who also uh, propounded this idea is that the Supreme actually has, is, uh, has as its attributes the finite cells or the Jivatmans or the what is called the Atman or Jivatman, the Chit Chakti, the the, the power of consciousness, which is, which is the individual soul. So now in the Vedanta itself, in the Upanishads, there are, 30, there are 32 Brahma Vidyas mentioned in different Upanishads. Now, why does he mention Brahma Vidya? The word Brahma Vidya is, Vidya means knowledge, and it means, in this sense, Vidya means uh, ways of attaining knowledge, Attaining knowledge of what? Attaining knowledge of Brahman or Brahma or, or Brahma. So Brahma Vidyas, there are 32 methods laid down in the Upanishads for seeking knowledge of Brahman. Because even according to Adi Shankaracharya, Moksha or liberation, the fourth Purusharta, or the main, the, the, the ultimate Purusharta, the ultimate goal of human life is to attain liberation from this, this world. And the method of attaining liberation is by understanding. The spiritual by understanding Brahman, understanding Ishvara, understanding our relationship with Him, 
understanding spirit, the spiritual nature underlying everything in, in creation. Okay, so these Brahma Vidyas, right, which is the scope of the Upanishads. Remember, we have Tatpahita and Purusharta. So the Upanishads also, these Prasthana tries, the Gita, the Upanishads and the Brahma Sutras, they teach us, these are the basic philosophical texts which teach us the real, what is reality, in, what is reality in this world, what is the goal, and what is the method to reach the goal, which is, and the goal is understood to be moksha. Moksha in terms of Ramanuja and the Sri Vaishnavas is eternal loving service of the soul, the individual soul, to the Supreme Lord Sri Manarayana in Vaikuntha, in, in, in his eternal heaven, Sri Vaikuntha. Okay, so these 32 Brahma Vidyas are mentioned in different Upanishads. So one of the main Upanishads, one of the early main Upanishads, Taittiriya Upanishad, states that the concept of Sharnagati or Nyasa Vidya finds its place as a means for attaining moksha. So there are also some other places in the Vedas, in the Shruti, in the, in the Upanishads and the, even in the Shruti texts themselves, right, that mention about this Nyasa Vidya. Normally when we talk about these different, like there might be Gayatri Vidya. Gayatri Vidya means by chanting Gayatri, by understanding the Gayatri Mantra, uh, which is a particular prayer which talks about Brahman or Ishwara, the Supreme right, that we can attain knowledge of the Supreme. But, but Sharanagati or su surrender to the Lord or property, right, which is also called is, called, is called one of these 32 Upanishadic Vidyas. Because some people, some people will say that, oh, Sri Vaishnavism has this idea of surrender to the Lord or property or Sharanagati, but it's not a Vedic thing. It's come, it's come from somewhere else. It's come from the Pancharatras or it's come from some other books. It's not, it hasn't come from the original Vedas, but that isn't true. So what the author here is saying here is the, the origin of, of this Sharanagati or property concept of surrender to the Lord in order to gain knowledge and in order to achieve uh, moksha or liberation, right, is one of the 32 methods mentioned in the Prasthana Trai, especially in the Upanishads. So these Upanishadic Vidyas, and the, and the particular one is called Nyasa Vidya. We can go through all the 32 if you like, but this Nyasa Vidya, or which is otherwise called Sharagati or Property Surrender, is considered to be the easiest and quickest and surest method given in the Upanishads. Because there are many methods given in the Upanishads, 32 to be precise. So for Ramanuja, there are two important sadhanas namely bhakti and sharanagati. So this is another thing to attain moksha, right? So these, this is another thing because we see, if we read the prasthana trai, right? We read the Upanishads, we read the... So in, here we see that in the Upanishads, there's 32 different ways given, right? 32 different ways. So that's, first of all, if, if somebody says to me, you have 32 different choices, and I say, well, okay, so how do I make the choice about which one, or, or do I have to perform a number of these, or... How, what do I do? You know, so, you know, please find a teacher to, uh, to ask this question to and, and, and what is the answer to the, what is the answer to this question? If there's 32 ways given in the Upanishads, then it becomes confusing. Which way should we do? Should we do more than one way, etc. Similarly, we have in the Bhagavad Gita, we have different yogas, different methods, which are also uh, given to us as Karma Yoga, Gyata Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and property or sharanagati. So we have these different methods. So which one is the one that I should take up? That will depend upon uh, what these, uh, what, how, uh, what, what are the details of these different methods? So here, Ramanuja, he's emphasizing two particular methods. One is bhakti, which is spoken of in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, bhakti yoga. And the other is Sharanagati. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the uh, major philosophical texts, the Prasthana Traya, right? Lord Krishna teaches Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. And he seems to indicate that Bhakti Yoga is a method to liberation. And Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga, yoga are ancillaries. They can be performed to help us to perform the Bhakti Yoga properly. And then at the end of Bhagavad Gita, based on the 18th chapter, verse 66, which is one of the esoteric secret mantras, uh, which is called the Krishna Charma Sota, Sarvadamam Prithi Jamami Kamsharanam Vaga Aham Tasarvapapi Dhyo, Moksha Yishiri Masu Jaha. According to that verse, 
this Sharnagati or property or what we all call in the Upanishads as Nyasa Vidya, the system of surrender to God is the easiest and quickest and surest method. So, according to Ramanuja, there's basically these two methods which, are, which he recommends out of the 32 Vidyas. One is Bhakti Yoga, right? And one is Sharnagati or otherwise known in, the, in Upanishadic terms as Nyasa Vidya. To attain moksha, just as Brahman or the Supreme Ishvara Sri Narayana, right, does not cancel but fulfills the finite, right? So, uh, this is this is not a this this type of moksha or liberation that we're talking about is not a merging of the individual self into the supreme self, but a coexist an eternal coexistence of the individual as a, as the eternal loving servant of the supreme self, right? Of of Atman and Paramatman. The, this, the individual self and the supreme self. Um, so, so, so we, so unlike Advaita, like the Vedantic philosophy of Adi Shankaracharya, which is called Advaita, where the idea is to that the that the individual self has no eternal being in itself, it, it it ends up just merging at liberation into the supreme self, right? And this world also has no real existence, separate existence, or no permanent real existence. And simply is Brahman, is one homogeneous, impersonal, supreme self. So that is Adi Shankar. So here, quite clearly, Ramanuja doesn't favor that. He doesn't favor the canceling of the individual finite entity called the self, the individual self, at liberation. Uh, but he, 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 he understands there's, there's an eternal relationship, an internal eternally separate nature to this individual. So also bhakti does not cancel the intellectual and moral values, but puts them in perfect order. So he's talking about in bhakti yoga, there are intellectual and moral values that, that are explained and they are part of bhakti yoga process. Bhakti can be defined as a constant loving remembrance of God with faith. And Ramanuja has given an example in his Sri Basha of pouring uh, oil from one container to another container, it makes a, a continuous stream, which looks like a solid. It's so continuous, right? When we pour oil from one, one container to another container, it seems to be an unbroken flow of oil like that. So he's saying that bhakti is like this, or devotion to God is like this. It should be, in order for bhakti yoga to be, uh, fruitful as a as an upaya as a method for attaining moksha, it needs to be continuous and unbroken, like a flow of oil from one container to another. So bhakti can be defined as a constant loving the remembrance of God with faith. Right now, there are there are of course examples of people who remembered God always, but they they did not have faith in God, such as Shishupala or Kamsa, people who were inimical towards towards uh, Lord Krishna but they always remembered him but they remembered him in a, in a in a this is not called bhakti because bhakti is a constant loving remembrance of God so not just a remembrance but a loving remembrance right whereas Sharnagati or surrender or property or nyasa vidya is the meeting point of human effort and divine grace right? And it is the place in which human effort exhausts completely and transfers its entire responsibility to, to the gods, to God's grace. So the idea of Sharnagati is a little bit different from Bhakti, right? Yes, in both Sharnagati and Bhakti, there is this constant loving remembrance of God. But the idea in Bhakti Yoga is that that has to be constant, that has to be loving, that has to be there all the time in order for Bhakti Yoga to succeed. In a, of course, there has to be the grace of God also, but that is a type of cooperative grace. And without those two things cooperating, the individual's, the individual's constant uh, loving remembrance and the Supreme Lord's uh, grace, which is, which is dependent upon the faith and works of the individual, that loving, constant loving relationship, that, that, that together creates the system where it creates the, 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 uh, the uh, the, uh, the end result of, of the individual attaining liberation. Whereas, whereas in Sharanagati, the, the, 
the the individual may or may not have constant loving remembrance of God, but in uh, but by taking to surrender to God, he's transferring the responsibility completely to the Lord of saving himself, of saving the individual, like that. So it becomes entirely the the responsibility of God. So that is a, that is not cooperative grace, but that is uh, causeless grace or pristine grace, right? So. Okay, so let's continue on. The unique contribution, so these are seen, uh, Bhakti Yoga and Sharanagati or Prapati or Nyasa Vidya are seen as two separate paths in Sri Vaishnavism, whereas in other forms of Vaishnavism, that surrender to God is seen as a cooperative system, right, which is part of Bhakti Yoga. And we have in Navada Bhakti, we have Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnusmanam, Parasevanam, Achanam, Mandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmani, Vedanam, all these different processes, nine processes of devotion, Atmani Vedanam being surrender to the Lord, but that surrender is within the process of Bhakti Yoga. Whereas the Sri Vaishnavas are saying, yes, there's a process of surrender within Bhakti Yoga, that is Bhakti Yoga. And there's also a separate process of surrender without Bhakti Yoga or, or without, uh, there can still be Bhakti acts of devotion, but without the idea that those acts of devotion are, are in any way cooperative or causing the end result, which is liberation or moksha. Uh, they are just simply done as uh, selfless service unto the Supreme Lord. Okay, so this is the distinction between bhakti yoga and prapati or sharanagati. The unique contribution of Sri Vaishnavism is, is the exposition of the doctrine of sharanagati, right? So no other system separates those two, right? Those two things and makes them into two different parts. It is called by different names, such as Prapati, Upayatva, Pratana, which means Pratana means a, a prayer, and Upayatva means the prayer of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the means, the prayer of the means. Nyasa Vidya, which we mentioned, is one of the 32 Upanishadic Vidyas. Nikshepa Raksha, Nikshepa Raksha means surrender and being protected, and, and, taking shelter of being protected, Bharanyasa, which means um, placing the burden of one's salvation on the Lord and transferring the burden uh, to him of, of one's salvation, uh, giving up that burden. That's uh, Sadhya Bhakti, uh, which may, have, may be used by other Vaishnavas to mean uh, different, different things, but here it's, it's meant to mean Sharanagati or Prapati or Nyasavidya. Atmanik Shepa, Atmanik Shepa, the surrender of the soul. Atma Samarpana, or the offering of the soul, like that. In the following verse of the Ahibudnya Samhita, which is a Pancharatra Atma Samhita, it mentions in Ahibudnya Samhita 37, Samitsa, Samit Sadhana Sadhana Kadinam Yajnanam Nya Samit Manaha Namasa Yo karo deva sasvadvara udirtaha. The word namaha, which is uh, given here, namasa in the second uh, line, right, is is significant is significantly used to mean the self surrender or sharanagati. So namaha, the word namaha in Sanskrit can be further broken down to be na, which means not, and ma, which means me. So when I offer respects to others, I say namaha or namaste or namaskaram, right? I am offering my nama, not for me, but for you, I'm offering respects, namaha. So uh, literally the word sharanagati means one who has fallen at the lotus feet of the Lord seeking refuge from all danger and sins. The path of Sharanagati is open to all people, irrespective of caste, creed, religion, sex, time, or place, or gender, for communion with God. So uh, some people may see Bhakti Yoga like that. In Sri Vaishnavism, Bhakti Yoga is supposedly uh, also including Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga. Karma Yoga, Karma Yoga involves many, many activities that, that have to be performed by male uh, Trivarnikas, people of the twice-born castes, right, and also uh, and also by people, frankly speaking, who know Sanskrit, right. 
in uh, in uh, jnana yoga. So so it becomes uh, out of the reach of many people, right? But here we're saying that property or sharanagati or or yasavidya can be performed by anybody, regardless of time, place, circumstance, uh, caste, creed, religion, or gender. So, though bhakti and sharanagati are accepted sadhanas to attain mukti or liberation, right? Bhakti marga could be practiced uh, by a few, whereas sharanagati is open for all to practice. Okay, so I just explained that. Bhakti needs certain important preconditions which were prescribed by the scriptures. Only those who are fit for observing Vedic rites, right? Which means that three, the three, uh, the males of the three castes, Varna, uh, 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 Vaishyas, Chatriyas, and Brahmins, right? The Trivarnikas, the three higher castes, right? Are, are on, uh, eligible to perform that. And, uh, uh, and uh, who are authorized to read the Vedas, be, becoming authorized to read the Vedas means taking the Upanayanam Samskara, getting the sacred thread, learning the Gayatri Mantra, practicing the Sanya Vandana three times a day. And then one becomes, one can then read the Vedas, one can learn the Vedas and can understand not only uh, recite the Vedas and learn the Vedas by heart, but also understand the meaning of the Vedas. So you can understand that if, uh, if, if the, if the Prasanna Trai, the basic texts of philosophy are the Upanishads, which are part of the Vedas, the Brahma Sutras, which explain the, the aphorisms, uh, the, the commentaries on the Brahma Sutras, which quote from the Upanishads to explain the, the cryptic aphorisms, right, on Brahman, on Ishvara, on, this, on reality, right, which will give us the, the knowledge of reality from the Vedas, from the Vedanta, right, uh, which is Tattva, the process, and also mentions the Hitha and the Purusharta in terms of the Nyasa Vidyas, the 32 Upanishadic Vidyas. These are all given in the Upanishads, which are in Vedic Sanskrit, which have to be understood only by those persons who can access that, that, that literature, which are people who have taken Upanayana and who, and, uh, who, are, follow, uh, who are doing Sanyarandana. Right? This is a qualification for study of the Vedas. Right? So if two out of three, even if we say, okay, the, the Mahabharata is considered like a fifth, fifth Veda by some people, so even that may be considered off limits to women and to non, non trivarnikas or Sudras, right? But in fact, the many, most people think because it's in classical Sanskrit and the Mahabharata is, and the Bhagavad Gita is certainly open to everybody. So, but even then, it doesn't cover the complete prasthana tray, the full gamut of of the texts on the basic texts on Vedanta philosophy. So here the point is that only those who are fit for observing the, the Vedic rites and who are authorized to read the Vedas are eligible to, to, to practice bhakti or bhakti yoga, let's say, in Sri Vaishnavism. Right? That's according to Sri Vaishnavas. And you know, in other forms of Vaishnavism and in other sampradayas and other sects, they do consider that people can perform bhakti or bhakti yoga, but is a different type of bhakti yoga. It's not based on the Upanishads. It's not based on. It may be based on some other some other um, scriptures like the Bhagavad Purana or or uh, some other some other classical Sanskrit um, um, or the Pancharatras or whatever it is, but not on the Vedas themselves, not in the Vedanta. The three higher class people, namely Brahman, Sakshi, and Vaishyas, are eligible to practice bhakti, but the Sudras are not el eligible, according to Sri Vaishnavas. As there are certain conditions for Vanashrama dharmas. Now, Vanashrama is a social system uh, that, that is the backdrop drop to uh, Indian medieval and ancient society, where, which was divided up into four, four classes or castes and four different aspects of one's life, four different, um, four different uh, uh, stages of life. The ashramas are called four different stages of life. The varnas are called the four different castes. So the dharma means uh, following the rules and regulations of that particular social system. So uh, there are also certain conditions for ashrama dharmas as well, right? For instance, if we read in Bhagavad Gita, I'll give an example. A sannyasi is not allowed to cook. A sannyasi is not allowed to touch fire, right? So sannyasi to yogi cha na niragni na chakriya. Niragniya. So yogis and sannyasis are not supposed to touch fire. They're not supposed to cook for themselves. Right? 
It says in Bhagavad Gita, yogi, uh, so sannyasi to yogi cha. Cha means and. So sannyasis and yogis, niragmir, 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 not, they are not allowed to, to do fire sacrifice. They're not allowed to cook uh, or using fire. They cannot. Right. So that is a, that is a rule of the ashrama dharma. Similarly, we have certain rules for brahmacharya, certain rules for prihastas, certain rules for vanapasas. So there are many rules of ashrams also. So not just the caste rules or the class rules of the different uh, Brahman Chattis, Vajras, and Sudras, but we have also the ashram rules of brahmacharya, uh, prihastas, vanapasas, and sannyasins. So the sutrakara, meaning Veda Vyasa or Badarayana, who has made the Brahma Sutras, the different a- the philosophical af- aphorisms, which sort the, the philosophical portions of the Vedanta, the Upanishads, into different <clears throat> uh, what we call adhikaranas or um, uh, chronological subjects. Um, they, the Sutrakara declares that an aspirant for any one of the four ashramas is allowed to practice bhakti because dharmas help him towards the perfection of, of upasana. Upasana means the worship of God. Right. But who is, who, is, who, is a, who is a person who can take to the ashramas? Only the Trivarnikas can take to the Grihastha ashram, the Vanaprastha ashram, and the Sannyasa ashram. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the Brahmachari ashram, the Vanaprastha ashram, and the, and the Sannyasa ashram. The Grihastha ashram alone is open to all, to all of the castes, including the Shudras and ladies, women. So thus, bhakti requires certain preconditions and does not permit all castes to practice it. But Ramanuja allowed even each and every one, uh, those who are interested to, follow, to, to know, to follow Sharnagati sadhana, irrespective of their competence and social status. Thus, Sharnagati or property is open to all, is open to everyone. And it's even open to animals, to non-human beings. And we have examples of Jatayu, of Gajendra, right, who attained liberation or moksha through Sharanagati, through surrender to God, right. So uh, Gajendra was an elephant, uh, Jatayu was a vulture, right. So even a bird or an elephant, um, they can they can uh, take to Sharanagati. So what to speak of human beings, even non-humans, or even pe- even people who are considered lower than humans, right? They can take to this. What to speak of? the Shudra class or the, or the women class. So now Bhagavad Purana, which is another Purana, Vishnu Purana was mentioned as giving us a, a, an overview of the beginnings of Sri Vaishnavism. Bhagavad Purana, Bhagavad Purana is another very famous Purana. And these are all Satvika Puranas, Puranas that teach us about Sri Narayana and his different avatars. Speaks about the nine forms of bhakti. So this is what I mentioned before, Shravanam, Kirtan, and Vishnu. So here it says, Shravaram, Kirtanam, Vishwasvaranam, Parasevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasim, Satyam, and Atmanivedanam. Okay? So these basically mean hearing about Lord, Lord Sriman Narayana, chanting about Sriman Narayana, praising him, right? Remembering about, about Lord Vishnu, about Sriman Narayana, Parasevanam, serving his lotus feet or serving him, right? Archanam means serving, uh, in, ritualistically serving his, uh, his deity form, Vandanam offering prayers, Dasyam, um, surrendering to him as a servant, Satyam, uh, getting a rela- uh, friendly relationship with him and Atmani Vedanam, surrendering one's own self or one's soul directly to him. So among these nine ways, the first three relate to contemplation, right? So what's the first three? Travanam, Kirtanam, Vishwasparanam. So we hear, we chant, and we remember the Supreme Lord. Uh, and other uh, and, and other three uh, explain divine activities. So the next three, the next three we have: so Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishwasvaram, and then Parasevana, Marchanam, and Bandhanam. These are all uh, activities that we that we that we do. We do. We serve serve the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. We serve. We do uh, deity worship or icon worship of the Supreme Lord, and Bandhanam offer prayers in that in that way. So then the, the last three, Dasim Sakimanat Mani Vedanam, becoming a servant, becoming a friend, and, and offering everything, offering one's very self, right? Uh, la- and lastly, the three, namely Dasim doing service to the Lord Sakya, making a type of relationship or friendly relationship with the Lord, not many Vedanam offering oneself to the Lord, explains Sharanagati. Explains Sharanagati. 
Right. So the development of bhakti is seen in Sharanagati in the awakening of divine grace. The doctrine of bhakti is like a ladder facilitating a linkage between earth and heaven, whereas Sharanagati makes a connection between heaven and earth. Okay, so what he's saying here basically is bhakti yoga is a, an ascending process where one has to perform different activities, right? First hearing, first hearing, then chanting, then remembering, then, you know, becoming, you know, then, uh, then serving in some, in some way, maybe through uh, karma yoga, offering the fruits of one's uh, activities, then archanam actually uh, worshipping the Supreme Lord in a personal iconic form, deity form, vandanam offering prayers to, that, to, to the Supreme Lord like that, and then becoming a servant, becoming a more intimate servant, becoming a friend, and then, uh, and then finally, finally, uh, uh, finally uh, surrendering everything. Whereas, so that is bhakti yoga, but whereas Sharanagati or Prapati or Nyasa Vidya takes it the other way around, starting at the very end with Upmani Vedaram, simply surrender to the Lord. And all of these other things come about automatically. So like reverse, from heaven to earth. So place the burden on the Supreme Lord who's in heaven to arrange for all these other things to happen, all these other uh, attributes to occur. So, uh, uh, so um, Dasyam, doing service to the Lord Sakyam, making it. Uh, so the development of bhakti is seen as Sharanagati uh, in, in awakening of divine grace. The doctrine of bhakti is like a ladder from earth to heaven, where Sharanagati is like a connection between heaven to earth. Right, not depending upon us on earth, but depending on the Lord reaching down to us to save us, rather than us trying to reach up to try and. If you go to Rome and you see the Sistine Chapel, you see Adam reaching out towards God. But the Sri Vaishnavism idea is that is that God should reach out towards us and grasp us because if we if we have to depend upon our own reach to reach God, then we won't be able to do it. So the important requirements of bhakti are a clear knowledge about the sadhanas such as karma, jnana, and bhakti, besides willingness to undergo severe practice at all times. Okay, so that's the first thing. So bhakti, if one takes to a system of bhakti yoga, and this is explained in Bhagavad Gita, and uh, so many, there are so many rules and regulations. There's so, much, so, so there are sadhanas. Sadhanas means an actual method, a methodology to following this path of bhakti yoga which includes karma and jnana yoga as ancillaries, as helping, right? So one has to be, uh, first of all, qualified to, to perform those things. Then one has to understand what those sadhanas are, or all the do's and don'ts of those different sadhanas, of those different, the different methods. And one has to be willing to, to undertake that, that practice for a long time uh, and constantly, it has to be done constantly, right? Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, second, B, the qualification, right, which, I, which was mentioned before. The qualification is of the birth such as Brahman, Chatriyas, and Vaishyas. C, sattvic patience. To endure any delay to attain moksha because all our parabdha karma have to be exhausted before uh, liberation occurs. So parabdha karma is that karma which is uh, uh, we have the reactions to sinful actions or, or pious actions that we've done, pious or sinful actions that we've done in previous births or, or which are uh, aligned with us, right, which, are, which have to be exhausted first. So the bhakti has to wait for that. He not only has to do all of this, but he has to wait for that to be exhausted. And at the end, he can attain moksha. Uh, if a bhakti commits a small mistake, the whole exercise of bhakti will collapse like a pack of cards. But when bhakti overcomes all temptations by strictly following the philosophy of bhakti, when a bhakti overcomes all temptations by strictly following the philosophy of bhakti, he will reach the Vaikuntha, the supreme abode of, of the Lord Srimanarayana, the abode of Lord Vishnu, right? The roads of bhakti are full of ups and downs. That is why the saying goes, bhakti is like a bridge of hair Built, uh, built over a river of fire. So hair, if you take hair, it burns very easily just with heat. What to speak of the flames of a fire, it completely burns instantly in the, in the flames of a fire. So a bridge of hair 
Bhakti is like a bridge of hair over a river of fire. Right? And down the bottom here in the, in the footnote, he's given uh, Bhagavad Purana's seventh canto, fifth chapter, 23rd verse, which is the is where the definition of uh, Navada Bhakti comes. Those nine, those nine processes of uh, of Bhakti Yoga, which is a verse spoken by Prahlad Maharaj, Prahlad, Bhakti Prahlad, the devotee of son of uh, the demon here on Yukashipu, uh, who, who mentioned this. So now from the above discussion, it's clear that Bhakti as, is a sadhana that cannot be followed by all people because of its preconditions, such as Shastra Jnana. One has to know the Shastras perfectly, right? Birth in a particular Trivarnika family, right? Brahman, Chetra, Vaisha, etc. So Yamunacharya says in his Stotra Ratna, which is a, which is a, a hymn of uh, 63, I think 63 or 64 verses, right? Which is a gem of hymns of Sri Vaishnavism. And if anybody wants to have a, a full understanding um, of uh, Stotra Ratna and the, the, the meanings of these different, um, this, this hymn of Yamunacharya, which deals with Sharanagati very deeply, Right, they can go to uh, the classes by Dr. Tira Narayana here on uh, on the same channel, and you can look for Stotra Ratna by Yamunacharya. And there's a whole set of uh, more than hundreds of of, of hours of of, uh, of lectures on that. So here is a particular uh, one of the uh, one of the verses of one of the very very famous verses of Stotra Ratna. Nadharma Nadharma. Nadarmaman nisto smi na chat chatma vedi na bhakti man pats charanara vinde akinchano ananya gatisharanya tat padamulam sharanam prapadye. Sharanam means surrender. So it means the path of surrender, Sharanagati, is open for one who is unable to follow the path of action, karma yoga, knowledge, jnana yoga, and devotion, bhakti yoga and who has no other way of salvation. And so there's a footnote there. Footnote is the Vedanta Deshika's commentary on Sloka 22 of Stotra Ratna, page 62, quoted in Contribution of Yamuna to Vishishtadvaita by M. Narasimhachari, page 79 and 80. Okay. Uh, and so we continue on. Um, in in view of this, Ramanuja offered Sharanagati as an alternative moksha sadhana, a method or means or an apaya to reach moksha or reach mukti or liberation for ignorant people who have no, no shastric knowledge. So for those persons who are not jnanis, who are not uh, knowledgeable in all of these different scriptures, one can simply follow this path of Sharanagati because it doesn't require one to know all these things. So commenting on the, the Stotra Ratna, the verse above, Vedanta Deshi very lucidly says uh, about the general and most accepted definitions of Sharanagati as follows. Aham asma asmya pradhanam alayo kinchano gatihi tom evo paya bhutto me bhaveti pratanam atiti Sharan Sharangati Rityukta Sa Devas Devasmin uh, Prayud Prayudjatam. It means property or Sharanagati is a state of mind praying to the Lord that he alone should become the means of saving the devotee, associated with the realization that the devotee is um, is utterly helpless sinful and without any hope of salvation, any other hope of salvation, right? So this is from Vedanta Deshika's commentaries on Stotra Ratna, page 62, quoted in the contribution of Yamunacharya to Vishishta Dvaita by M. Narasimhacharya, page 81. So, um, and we also have here, uh, Ananya Sadye Swabishte Mahavishvasa Purvakam Tadeko paya yatva yachna papatis charanagati he. Okay, so this, this means uh, it means that property or charanagati is the state of prayerfulness of mind associated with the firm conviction that the Lord alone is the savior and there is no other way of attaining him except by absolute surrender. And this 
footnote number three says it comes from Deshiga, Deshiga's commentaries on Stoja Ratna, page 62, quoted in Contribution of Yamunacharya of Yamuna to Vishishtabreda by M. Narasimacharya, page 81. You can have a look at that. So now another great, uh, another great scholar, Sri Vaishnava scholar, Professor P. N. Srinivasacharya, right, who has uh, written a very, he has written what his book, I believe, is Philosophy of Vishishtabreda, correct? Okay. Which is also a very good book to read. Ramanuja assures God to, to all, irrespective of caste and, or creed, and provides an alternative sadhana for weak people to attain moksha, which is known as property or sharanagati. And this is uh, footnote four from page 382 of Philosophy of Vishishtabhita by PN, Tri, Professor PN Srinivasacharya. Okay, Professor S, S. N. Das Gupta. Das Gupta is very famous for writing history of uh, history of Indian philosophy in uh, I think six volumes or five or six volumes, right? Um, says that the property of Sharanagati as seeking protection of God is not restricted by any limita limiting conditions of holy or unholy places or any special time or any special mode or any caste restriction or that it can produce only this or that result. When God accepts through sharanagati or surrender, he forgives all his, uh, of the person's faults of commission and omission, right? A fault of commission means if we, if we purposely perform some sinful activity or some problem, even if we perform a pious activity and it, it gives us some karma that we have to work out. Or a sin of omission means that we didn't do something which we were supposed to do, right? The only fault he does not forgive his insincerity or cruelty. That is called prarya. Okay, so that the quote for that is coming from History of Indian Philosophy, again, by Dasgupta, S.N. Dasgupta, volume number three, page 376. So here our author is quoting from all these standard texts uh, which have come before him by great Sri Vaishnava scholars. So here, whatever may be the definition of Sharanagati, the main requirement for Sharanagati is that one should completely surrender one's duties and responsibilities to the God, to God in the form of prayer with supreme faith or Mahavishvasa. Mahavishvasa means great faith without egoism while quoting, uh, while quoting from Sri Vachana Bhushanam, which is another book by Pila Lokacharya with the commentary on Ma by Malavala Mahamunigal, which comes after the Mamukshapati. Again, one of the 18 esoteric books of the Astadas Rahasis of Pila Lokacharya. Professor Das Gupta further says as follows When the person who, is who has sincerely adopted the path of Sharanagati must annihilate altogether even the traces of egoism, on the one hand, egoism means ignorance. For it is only by false knowledge that a man asserts himself as having an independent being. On the other side, egoism means insincerity, prorya. The fundamental requirements of Sharanagati, therefore, consist in the annihilation of egoism. It is only through the annihilation of egoism that the perfect self-surrender or Sharanagati is possible. And the, the quote again here is from uh, from. Sri Vachana Bhushana Vyakya, or the commentary on Sri Vachana Bhushana, quoted in History of Indian Philosophy, volume three, page 378 and 379. So the present work makes a sincere attempt to study the philosophical contributions made by the Sri Vaishnava saints, seers and thinkers to the doctrine of Sharanagati or, or surrender. The main source of this study are the original works of Ramanuja. So we mentioned those original nine works. Pilai Lokacharya's Asidasi Rahatsis, or the 18 works, esoteric works by Pilai Lokacharya, and Vedanta Deshika's Rahasya Triasara, which is also uh, on uh, esoteric uh, meanings, to explain this doctrine. Besides these, other important works in Sanskrit, Tamil, and Telugu have also been consulted. So that's good. He's explaining to us where he's getting all the information from. This book consists of seven chapters. 
The first chapter deals with the nature and destiny of the individual soul as enlightened in Charvaka, Jainism, Buddhism, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Mimamsa, and Advaita. Okay, so he's going to deal with in the first chapter the individual soul or the Atman, otherwise known as the Jivatman, or in Vedantic terms, when we uh, is known as Chit or consciousness, the individual consciousness, not to be uh, not to be um, confused with Ishwara or the Supreme Consciousness or Paramatman. So the Atman, the individual soul, and understanding, right, the nature and destiny of the individual soul in different uh, Indian uh, philosophical traditions. And the traditions are Charvaka, which is Indian atheism, Jainism, right, Buddhism, and there are different forms of B Buddhism, right, Nyaya, which means the school of logic, Vaisheshika, which is the school uh, by Kannada, by the uh, sage Kannada, Samkhya, which is, uh, um, uh, which is a, a, a method, a, a epistemologically um, counting different, different and, and categorizing certain, certain aspects. Mimamsa, which means discussion. And here, Mimamsa means Purva Mimamsa. It means discussing, discussing the Karmakanda section of the Vedas. Right and uh, and the deliberation on that, and Advaita, which is the uh, the Vedanta or the the Uttarimamsa commentary on the uh, on the Upanishads uh, by Adi Shankaracharya, which comes to the conclusion of complete oneness, Kaval Advaita or Advaita. Uh, so, in in the light of all those different philosophies, he's going to explain the understanding of the Sri Vaishnava system of Sharanagati and how the how the soul, how the individual soul fits in, the, in, in fits in and contrasts the, the understanding of the soul in all these other in all these other um, uh, sects and, and, and doctrines. So the discussion focuses on the ontological position of the individual self as a real entity, as a supreme Brahman, through adjective, though adjectival in nature. So the, the individual soul is also considered to be Brahman in the sense of being spiritual. But it is like a small spark, whereas the Supreme Brahman, Sri Narayana, the Paramatma, is like a huge raging fire. So the individual is not quantitatively the same as the Supreme, but is qualitatively similar to the Supreme Person, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, qualitatively sim similar. So uh, he's explaining here that he's adjectival in nature. So the, the, the spark is adjectival. Uh, it is a mode of the fire, whereas the, the individual soul is a mode of the Supreme Lord. His adjectival in nature is well discussed according to Vishishtadvaita Vedanta. The finite selves are infinite, so there are infinite numbers of them, uh, which, are, which are different from the body on one hand and the Supreme Brahman on the other. So the individual self is going to be explained to be different from the material body that it inhabits right, and pervades, the consciousness of the individual self pervades the body, our bodies, which is made of material, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, right, mind, intelligence, and ego, these are also subtle, subtle body. So this is described in the Bhagavad Gita, so these eight uh, coverings that cover this, the individual soul in this body are material. The soul itself is not material. It is, it is a little spark of Brahman, this is qualitatively similar to the Supreme, right? And uh, just like the, 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 the spark is qualitatively similar to the raging fire. So on the one hand, the soul is different. The individual soul or Atman is different from the body, from its body, and also different from Ishvara, also different from the Paramatma or the Supreme Person, Sri Narayana, or God. The summum bonum of the individual self is to attain moksha. So it's, it's, it's liberation which means eternal service of the Lord in his eternal abode of Vaikuntha, right, or heaven, right, is the, is the best goal, is the greatest goal for the individual self. And this is the main theme of Sri Vaishnavism, which is well uh, elucidated in this particular chapter, the first chapter. So then in the second chapter, he's giving a preview here in the introduction of the different chapters and what's dealt with in, in them in more detail. So in the second chapter, there is a philosoph the philosophical antecedents 
of the doctrine of Sharanagati. If we can say that they're antecedents, because actually we've seen up till now, we've seen that Sharanagati is there in the original Vedas, which are eternal. So we can't really say in terms of time, uh, there were philosophical doctrines prior to Sharanagati. But when he says antecedents here, philosophical antecedents means there were other philosophies which were preached more in, 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 in this world, in history, uh, before Sharanagati was uh, completely and fully um, explained by, by, first of all, by the, the, uh, the Alwars and then by the Acharyas of Sri Vaishnavism. So um, this chapter is exclusively devoted to tracing Sharanagati in the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Purana, the Ramayana, the Bhagavad Gita, and lastly in the works, the Nalayajuni Purana, the 4,000 Tamil hymns of the Alwars. So property, the property is an intrinsic truth of the Vedas, which ordains that an individual self could, should cultivate a life of devotion and godliness for attaining moksha or liberation. Unflinching faith in divine guidance is implicit in the entire mass of the holy texts. Right? So we talk about this Mahavishvasha or great faith. There has to be great faith uh, on the part of the individual. The Upanishads, the Upanishads, right, which are part of the Shruti, part of the Vedas, right, which is called Vedanta, the last part of the philosophical part of the, of the Vedas, which are significant, which are the significant mouthpiece of the Vedas, have also ordained Sharanagati. The Bhagavad Gita, which is a repository of the quintessence of all the teachings of the Upanishads, professes, professes in an unmist unmistakable terms about the significance of, of Sharanagati as a means to attain liberation or moksha, like that. So the Bhagavad Gita, again, has this verse, Saradaman Pritita, Mamikam Sharanagata, Krishna Charma Sloka, which clearly shows that property is a way or Sharanagati is a, is a quick, easy, and sure method for attaining liberation like that. So the Bhagavad Gita is considered the quintessence of the essence or the essence of the Upanishad teachings, right? Even in the Gita uh, Dhyanam or the meditation on Bhagavad Gita, it says, Sarvo Panishado Gavo Dokta Gopala Nandanaha. So Lord Krishna has a has a is a cowherd, and his cows are considered to be Upanishads. And by milking those Upanishads, he came to the essence of the, the beautiful milk that he got from the Upanishads is the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so this is a very nice poetic way of understanding the essence of the of the Bhagavad Gita to be like the pure milk derived from cows, which are considered to be Upanishads. So uh, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, so then after the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Purana, the, the Sri Bhagavatam, as it's called, and the Ramayana, Sri Ramayana, are abounding in references to Sharanagati or, or surrender. Of course, Sri Ramayana is described as Sharanagati Veda. So among Sri Vaishnavas, the supreme uh, scripture for dealing with Sharanagati is the Ramayana in which the instance of Bibhishana, the brother of Ravana, so um, and the Sharanagati to Rama is enshrined as the very essence of the Ramayana. So the very essence of the Ramayana, which is a scripture par excellence, according to Sri Vaishnavas, on surrender to God, right, is, and the example given in there, there are many examples of, of surrender to God in the Ramayana. There's even examples of of uh, uh, unsuccessful surrender by by Lord Rama to, for instance, the the uh, Varuna, the the uh, demigod in charge of the ocean, etc. So we have different types of Sharanagati or surrender, which is explained in the in the in the uh, Ramayana. But the quintessence or the the essential, the best uh, type of form of uh, example given or the paradigm for Sharanagati or surrender is given in Vibhishana, the brother of Ravana's surrender to Lord Rama in the Ramayana. So again, this is also described in a special book called Abhaya Pradhana Saram, which mentions all these different parts of the Ramayana, which deal with Sharanagati, which is written by Vedanta Deshika. And Dr. Turin Ryan has given a course, we have a course uh, on, this, uh, on this YouTube uh, channel, you can look up Abhaya Pradhana Saram and you can go through that book and learn all about that. Rama Charma Sloka, how Rama has accepted Vibhishana, the surrender of Vibhishana in the Ramayana. And all of the, all of the different uh, aspects to that surrender of Vibhishana in the Ramayana. 
The chap in chapter three deals with the systemization, uh, systematization of Sharanagati or surrender as shown by different Acharyas. This contains the essentials of Sharanagati or, or surrender as codified by Yamunacharya, Ramanuja, Pila Lopacharya, and Vedanta Deshika. The development of Vaishnavism, particularly the theory of Sharanagati or property or surrender, as dealt with by Pila Lopacharya and Vedanta Deshika, the five or six ac accessories of Sharanagati, right, from the, from the, from the sloka Anapuya Susankalpa Padikuliya Susvajana, which is quoted from uh, Arya Buddha Samhita and Lakshmi Tantra of the Pancharatra, right? The incidents in Sri Ramayana are dealt with here, right? So apart from this, this chapter deals with the requirements for Sharanagati or surrender and the types, different types of Sharanagati or surrender. Moving on to chapter four. In chapter four, I have elaborated, explained the greatness of the three mantras, the Tiru Mantra, uh, uh, also called Astakshara Mantra, the eight-syllable mantra on the Monarayanaya, the Dwaya Mantra, which is made up of two parts, Sriman Narayana Tarnoshan and Bhupadhi, and Srimate Narayanaya Maha, and the Charma Sloka of Lord Krishna, which is the verse 1866 of Bhagavad Gita, Sarvata Ramam Pritija, Mami Kam Charam Hamtva Sarva Papi So he's going to explain the greatness of these three, three mantras, or these three prayers, right? From the sutras and commentaries of Pillai Lokacharya and Manavala Mahamuni, this commentator, respectively, and also from the Rahasya Triasaram, which is the great book of Vinanta Deshika. Chapter 5 introduces the conduct and duties of, uh, of a prapana, that is a person who performs property, a surrendered soul, a refugee at the feet of the Lord, who takes refuge at the feet of the Lord, so taking uh, not a devotee, but a refugee, a person who has no qualifications, but who's simply surrendered to the Lord, right? So introduce the contact uh, conduct and duties of a proper or refugee, covering the uh, uh, routine duties such as Abhigamana, Upadana, Ija, Swadhyaya, and Yoga, with examples from Vartamala, Sri Vachadabhushna, and Rasu Trayasara. So these are some uh, some the same uh, sort of scriptures which you're which you're explaining about Panchakala Kriya, these five types of activities that a prapada does during his day, right? This is also called anikam, what we do every day. But there are different types of activities. There are activities we do every day, activities which we do um, occasionally on different occasions, and activities that we do for a particular desire, for a particular purpose, like that. So here he's talking about daily activities, which are called nitya kriyas, right? And so they are divided usually up the day of a prapana of a surrendered soul to the Sri Mandarayana is divided up into five parts. Abhigamana means getting up and, and uh, do, doing one's ablutions, taking bath, putting on clothes and getting ready for, getting, getting ready for the day. The day being service to Sri Mandarayana, the, the whole life of the prapana of the refugee is service to the, to the Supreme Lord. The next section is called Upadana, collecting the materials by which he will serve and who will worship the Lord. Ija is the direct worship of the Supreme Lord, usually in the iconic deity form, right? Uh, Swadhyaya is study of the scripture or study of the, of the, of the process of Sharanagati, study of philosophy and doctrines and theology, right? And yoga is the meditation on the Supreme Lord until one falls asleep at the end of the day, like that. So these are the five sections of a, of a Prapanas or Refugees Day. Chapter six deals with bhakti. Bhakti meaning uh, devotion to the Lord. Uh, sometimes we make a distinction between bhakti and bhakti yoga because bhakti, can, certainly the Prapanas, the refugees, they can, do, they can do devotional activities, which is called bhakti. But they don't do them for the purpose of attaining liberation, which is bhakti yoga. So when we do something, in order to, yoga means to link, in order to link with the Supreme, to attain moksha, to get into that situation of eternal loving service to the, to the Lord in Sri Vaikuntha. If we do that, uh, if we do something, if we do some act, some karma for that, that's called karma yoga. If we, do, if we study some scripture, that's called jnana yoga. If we do some devotional activity to, to, attain that, to attain that result, right, that is called bhakti yoga. But if we don't want any result, but we simply want to serve the Lord, and do what he wants, right? Then that is called Sharanagati or Prapati Yoga, like that. 
So wherein I enumerate the themes of bhakti in the Vedas, the meaning of bhakti, types of bhakti, besides explaining the relationship between jiva and God and the merits of sharanagati or surrender. So there are nine types of relationship between the jiva and the Lord, between the individual soul and the supreme soul, which we will cover probably in this chapter six. Chapter seven discusses the doubts, right? So if there is any doubt, after going through the, the subject matter fully, right? If there's any doubt or any impediment to our understanding, which is called a virodi, right? Virodi means an impediment or viroda, right? Then, then we should clear those doubts at the end. So chapter seven discusses the doubts relating to the competence or adhikari, the qualification, right? Of a, of a prapana or a refugee, the nature or the swarupa of the, personality the, the, or the nature of Sarupa of, Sharna, of Sharnadhi, what is actual surrender? What does that mean, actually? What does surrender actually mean? The accessories or angas of Sharnadhi, what are the different aspects of Sharnadhi? And establishes the supremacy of Sharnadhi as being the easiest, quickest, and surest method to attain liberation. Finally, the main conclusion of the work is attempted at a comprehensive bibliography uh, showing all the source material that this work is based on is taken up. So that is the introduction to the greatness of Sharanagati. It's so comprehensive and so um, the, the, the theology, it fits as one, like, like one socket or one spoke, one, one um, component into another. Just, just you know, only while noting that it's pure, pure um, bhakti. But but the point you had said, sambanda abhideya and prayojana. You had it said it was uh, in the beginning. You had said it hit, and and two other components, and and which will be enumerated again later on. I, I think you said it um, in the following chapters. It's quite amazing to see the same the same um, these same three components replicated not only in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, but in Sri Vaishnavism. Is, are, are, are there any um, precedents for this in the Veda, Vedas itself? I mean, like outside of the, the speech of the Vaishnav canon, like the... Well, I mean, you know, even, even Adi Shankaracharya, he has, he has made a statement, Jnanat Mukshaha, Jnanat Mukshaha. Jnanat is the ablative case singular of jnana, means from jnana, from jnana, moksha. Moksha comes from jnana, right? So we have to have knowledge. So what does that mean? That means tattva, or it means uh, sambandha jnana, okay? So whatever, whatever you know, if, if Shankar just calls it jnana, you know, or jnana, right? Uh, the Gaudiya call it sambandha jnana, right? Knowledge of our relationship with God. Right, but that's what Shankar means. No, what is our relationship to Brahman? What is our relationship to the Supreme, to Ishra? Same thing, the Sri Vaishnavas, Tattva. What is our relationship to God? What is our relationship to the Supreme? So we have to know our relationship to the Supreme. Once we know our relationship to the Supreme, it becomes, it becomes clear that we are eternally meant to serve him. So then if, it, if, if we are not serving him now, how do we reach that service? Then... Shankara says by taking sannyas, by studying the Vedas, by studying the Vedanta, that's the only way to attain liberation. Uh, you know, and other, other Vaishnavacharyas, other Vaishnavacharyas will say different ways, you know. The Mimamsakas, the Purva, the, the Purva, Purva Mimamsakas, the Kamakandis, they say, oh, well, just, you have to you just perform the Vedic ceremonies and you go to Swarga. But Swarga is an eternal. So... As far as the school of Vedanta, there are these, there are these other schools which are called um, Gnostic schools, right? Some people, some people uh, translate the word Gnostic as atheistic. It doesn't really mean atheistic. It means that they, are, they don't accept the, the supremacy of the, of the Vedic understanding, the, uh, the Gnostic schools. So the, the Charvaka, Indian, Indian, Indian atheism, uh, Jainism. Buddhism, right? They don't accept the Vedas. So we can just discount them for a start because we're interested in following the Vedas. Mm -hmm. So in the Vedas, again, Sharanagati is there, right? Property is there. Bhakti is there in the Vedas, in the Vedanta, like that. 
but it's difficult to, to see it, just like it's difficult to see the, the, the milk in the cow. But when we milk, after we milk the cow, that's why the Bhagavad Gita easily shows us karma yoga, jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga. If we want to find those things in the Upanishads, we have to search through and we have to pick out, you know, the places. And then that's what Vedavyasa does when he makes his Vedanta Sutras. He makes these little aphorisms about, about these different topics. And he takes things from, and, and the Acharyas take quotes from different Upanishads to explain these different sutras in the Vedanta Sutras. So the, the, the knowledge is there in the Vedas. The knowledge is there in the Vedanta. The knowledge is there. Uh, the, the Alvars also took the knowledge of the Vedanta and put it into Tamil, into a language that everybody could understand in Tamil Nadu, right? It was their main language. So we have other examples of, of Tulsidas. Tulsi we have examples of other people who put, uh, you know, uh, Kamba put the Ramayana in, in Tamil. The Ramayana was put into, into, into Hindi. You know, so there are so many, there are so many people who have translated. Prabhupada put, put uh, Shri Bhagavatam into English like that. So sometimes these things have to be translated into different languages, but they're all coming from the same base. The same base is the Vedas. So these are all Vedic things. We are all Vedantins. We're all following of the Vedas. So why is there a difference between uh, Vishishta, Dvaita, 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 Veda, Veda, Chintya, Veda, you know, all these different forms of, or flavors of Vedanta is because of the interpretation of different acharyas of quoting different parts of the Vedanta for, on different topics. So somebody can make a, somebody can make a, a study of all the different acharyas on the different subjects. Right. And this is this is why we have the commentaries on the Prasthana Trai, the Prasthana Trai, the, the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras and the Bhagavad Gita. We have so many commentaries by different people explaining, explaining, you know, this particular sutra, what it, where, what Upanishad speaks to this sutra and what, what and this particular thing. Is there an explanation of this subject in the in the in the Vedanta? Yes, there is. OK, so. So bit by bit, people who go through the Vedanta, and usually what people do is that they'll go through and they'll discuss the different interpretations and the different understandings but the different acharyas are brought in with their different commentaries by quoting different things. Because in the Vedas, you're going to find what we call uh, Beta Shrutis, Abeda Shrutis, and Gatika Shrutis. So there are Beda Shrutis, there are, there are sections of the Vedanta, of the Upanishads that deal with difference, that the soul is different from God, that the earth, the uh, universe is different from God and the soul, right? Matter is different, right? That we have these three fundamental things, God, the souls, and the world, and the universe, right? And they're all separate. So, mm -hmm. so really, Vedanta has to do with the relationship between those three things. Now, now Shankaracharya, he comes and he says, look, According to me, I look through the, the Upanishads and I see all of the Abheda Shrutis. I see all of the parts of the Upanishads that say everything is one. And Madhva goes through them and he says, I see all of the, all the quotes. I forget about, forget about the other quotes that say everything's one. I see only the quotes that say that there's difference. difference. Right. And then Ramanuja says, Ramanuja says there are, there are quotes that say that things are one. So things are certainly one in one way, in some ways. And things are different in other ways. So we have Nimbarka, we have Chaitanya, we have Balde Vidyabhushana, we have, we have uh, Ramanuja, and we have, uh, we have uh, Balaba, we have all these great Acharyas who say, yes, we see oneness and we also see difference. And this is how we see it. This is how we see it. This is, this is one, this is different, this is like that. So that's the explanation. So that's why we have all these different um, groups. But basically, except for Madhva, and even Madhva, even Madhva sees oneness in some ways, right? Although, you know, uh, I've, I have many friends who are very nice Madhva Vaishnavas. They mostly, they see difference, but they see five types of difference, but they don't see a sixth type. So for instance, Madhva says that the, there are those three aspects. There's God, the souls, and the universe yeah. ma matter, right? So there's a, there's a difference between God and the soul. There's a difference between matter and the soul. There's a difference between the soul and another soul. There's a difference between a piece of matter and another piece of matter. And there's a difference between matter and God, right? These are five differences. Three things have five differences. 
They don't have six differences. The six difference would be a difference between one form of God and another form of God. There's no difference between Vishnu, Krishna, Rama, Narasimha. They're all God. So there's no difference between them. We can't say that there's many gods. There's only one God and he has, he may have different forms, but there's no essential difference between them. He may have different pastimes and things like that, but they're all God, right? So they're equal, right? We, we, even we say they are Vishnu Tattva. Vishnu Tattva, when we're talking about Tattva, we're talking about a category, right? Mm -hmm. So Tattva means category of truth. So they're all truly Vishnu, right? Mm -hmm. They're all truly Krishna. Right? Or Rama, like that, or Narasimha. Right? So these are just different names and different appearances and different pastimes, but the, the, essence, the essential being is the same. Mm -hmm. The essential God is the same. Narasimha is God, Krishna is God, Rama is God, Vishnu is God. They're all God. And there's only mm -hmm. one God. So they're all the same. Whereas, yeah. whereas there's a difference between my soul and your soul. There's a difference between my soul and matter, yeah. dull matter. There's a difference between my soul and the Paramatma. Right? These are all differences. So Madhvas believe in five types of differences. They call it Panchabeda. They have a doctrine called Panchabeda. Right. Other Vaishnavas also agree. We agree with that. Right? Uh, it's not, that's not wrong. The, now, so then, so that is what, that is what Vedanta is all about. Vedanta is all about understanding the, dif the differences and similarities. If you emphasize only some portions of the Upanishads, which talk about oneness, like Shankara does, he sees everything as one because he only emphasizes parts that say that everything is one. And these parts that say that everything is different, he says, no, no, that, that can't be right. That has to be secondary. So the same thing with Madhva. He says that the parts that say that things are one is secondary, like that. Ramanu just says there are three types of, of, of statements in the Vedas. There are Veda Shrutis, which talk about difference. There are Abheda Shrutis which talk about oneness. Yes. And there are Gatika Shrutis which could be talking about oneness and difference. difference. Either way, right there. So all of these statements come in the Vedas. And that's why we need to clarify them. And we need a philosophy that accepts all the Vedas and not just part of the Vedas. Not just part of Vedanta. So we don't say that, we don't say Madhva had, we don't say Madhva got it wrong. We don't say Shankara got it wrong because Madhva is a Dwaiti and a dualist and Shankara is a monist. Uh, uh, and not waiting, right? We just say what they have said is a half truth, right? When you go to the court, if you're a witness in court, you know, in a very serious matter, you will be asked to swear upon the scripture that you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If I ask you a question and I say, Yes, I saw this, and I don't mention, but I, but I, there was something else happened also, which makes this. Which, which makes what I said not exactly the truth, right? So I have to not only tell the truth, Shankara told the truth. In one sense, in one sense, everything is one. Everything is spiritual. This world is spiritual. The soul is spiritual and God is spiritual. They're all spiritual. So in one sense, they're all one, right? But it's, but it's, it's an illusion to say that they're completely one. They're one in every aspect. They're not one in every aspect. There are differences. So if I say, oh, everything's one, yes, there's some truth in there. But because I haven't mentioned that there's also difference, right, it becomes like a lie. So they say, if you don't, you can tell the truth, but if you don't tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, right, then, so you can tell the truth and not tell a lie, but you also don't tell the whole story, then it becomes like a lie sometimes because you haven't told the full truth. The full mm -hmm. truth. You haven't to tell the full truth. So the full truth has to take into consideration not only the, the, the parts of the Vedanta that talk about difference, but also the parts that talk about oneness and also the parts that talk about oneness and difference. Yes, and difference yeah. yeah. So, so every, every, there has to be a philosophy, one philosophy of the Vedanta Sutras, which encompasses all the Upanishadic teachings, not just this small piece here or this small piece there right this is sometimes people do this they'll they'll they selectively they'll quote from the scriptures right i can selectively quote from the scriptures i can say 
Oh, there's a scriptural quote that says in Kali Yuga that uh, no one can take sannyas in Kali Yuga. It's against the scriptures to take sannyas in Kali Yuga. Or everybody's born a sudra in Kali Yuga. Like that? Yeah, there are statements in the scriptures like that. But we have to look at the... Then, then how can we say that there can be sannyasis in Kali Yuga? Ramanujan was a sannyasi, Madhva was a sannyasi, Shankar was a sannyasi. They're all in Kali Yuga. Does that mean they're all bogus? They can't, they're not real sannyasis? Does that mean... If a person is born in Kali Yuga, is he automatically a Shudra? Can he not attain, you know, a, a higher state than a Sudra in society? No, he can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 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 there are statements in the scriptures, but unless we know all okay. unless we know all the statements of the scriptures, unless we understand the statements in the scriptures in context, then we can have problems. Then we can have problems. Right? The, the, a very classic example is the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi who started the TM, Transcendental Meditation uh, Sect, he, he translated the Bhagavad Gita, but he only translated the first six chapters. The end of the sixth chapter, Lord Krishna says, Yogi Nama Bisarvesham, Madgate Nantaratmana, Shradavan Bhajate Yomam, Same Yuktatamo Mataha, that the greatest person, the great, I consider the greatest person to be the yogi. So Mahesh Yogi saw this. He said, oh, Krishna says, God says the greatest person is a yogi. So I am teaching people to be yogis, to be meditating yogis. So that's, I'll stop here. But there are another 12 chapters of Bhagavad Gita. In the <laughs> end, Krishna doesn't say the yogi is the greatest. Mm -hmm. In the end, he says the refugee, the prapana, the prapana mm -hmm. is there. So Krishna teaches karma yoga. Yeah, Krishna teaches jnana yoga. Krishna teaches bhakti yoga. But if you simply stop, if you stop at this and you say that's all he teaches, then you don't know the scripture fully, perfectly. Sure. Right. Yeah. So that is, the, that is the point of where Ramanuja wanted to teach fully the scriptures. Now, of course, there are different sampradayas, but basically all the Vaishnava sampradayas, they all agree basically. That there are there are these three, uh, three tattvas. There's God, the souls, and the world, and, and matter. Chitta Chitta Ishwara, what we call Ishwara Jagat and Jiva, right? And and these three are eternally, uh, they eternally exist, and they have a certain relationship with each other, like that. So exactly the details of that, the different Vaishnav sampradayas have some different details on it, like that. These are all theologically, but but philosophically, basically they're all the same. So we can, you know, if somebody wants to do that, we could go through and we can look at the Vedanta Sutras, we can look at the Upanishads, we can look at the, the uh, we can look at the Bhagavad Gita, and we can see the different commentaries by the different Vaishnavacharyas, or even Shankara, and we can compare them, and we can see who is telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth, mm -hmm. right? And who is telling partial truth. And we can compare, like that, if somebody has time, like that. But what we're doing here with this book is we're saying, okay, all of that, that is a very long process of study to do all of that. We yeah. have been convinced that Sharanagati or property is, is, a, is a great system, right? It's mentioned by all the Acharyas, but mentioned by the Gaudiya Acharyas, mentioned by the Sri Vaishnava Acharyas. So let us go deeply into that particular one because that is easy, quick, and sure. Mm -hmm. So let's go into that. And then we'll leave a discussion of karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, all these other things, <laughs> all these other things and Vedanta for some other time when we have more time. Let us understand the essence first, fully, right? With reference to all those other scriptures too, not that we're leaving anything out. And then after we understand that essence, then if we want to fill in the gaps and we want to go fully into all of these other things, even if you want to discuss Charaka, Indian atheism or Buddhism or Jainism or all these other Saddarshanas, right? Like Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Yoga, Sankhya, right? The Pancharatras, the, the, you know, Shaiva Pasupata, the Shaiva Agamas. These are, there are books that describe all of these things and we can understand them all. But first we have to have a, a, an essential basic understanding, a substratum or a grounding in the, in the, in the, in the main thing. So we, when we under, after we understand the main thing, then we can go back and we can look with our, yeah. with our, with our knowledge, we can look at these other aspects. Om Namo Narayanaya